Um, so uh, I am, when I was invited to do this, I sort of, I didn't really know what I would talk about. I'm not an academic, I'm a, I'm a performing artist, uh, primarily a composer. Uh, and so I was sort of, I didn't answer Piero's requests for, you know, what's your subject, what's your topic, what's a, give us a pricey. And uh, I said, well, can we just have a phone call, because I don't really know what to talk about. And then he would sort of say, well, kind of, you know, kind of flabbergasted that you wouldn't have 20 minutes to talk about something. How about you talk about instrument building? And so, okay. So, so uh, I do, as, as, as Piero said, I do quite a, I do a variety of different things. They're all related to composing. Uh, contemporary, uh, quote-unquote, classical music, whatever that might mean, and that could mean a zillion different things. Um, and uh, so I do write chamber music, I write orchestra music, I, I, I work a lot with electronics and live performance, I make record, recording, recording media, I collaborate a lot with dance companies, theater companies, and I compose opera. And since high school, I also had this weird little sideline uh, of curiosity and sort of uh, exploration of uh, inventing musical instruments. Uh, I, I was, uh, my, my background, it, it, my father was a scientist, he was a mathematician, uh, and I was raised sort of in an atmosphere where my father said, well, we don't know, you know when you grow up you're going to be a scientist, we don't know what kind of scientist, you could be an anthropologist, you might be a physicist, an astronomer, but you'll be some kind of scientist. And so I lived with that for a long time, and, so, and the language of math and science and, the sci and whatever the scientific method might be, was very much a part of my way of seeing the world. Uh, but I also, my father was a very avid consumer of the performing arts. Uh, he forced me to see Aida when I was five years old. Um, and I hated it, and now I write opera. Uh, and uh, also would regularly go to concerts and theater and things like that. So I also, so parallel with that sort of, whatever, science worldview, my father, there was this very avid uh, engagement with all kinds of performing arts, including pop music. Uh, we went to rock concerts and things like that. And so, uh, as a teenager, I realized that music was what I wanted to do, and I fell in love with, uh, with performing and writing music and, and making my own music. Uh, in 11th grade, I wanted a 12-string guitar for, for Christmas, and instead my parents gave me a kit for build your own box guitar. And it was... Uh, it was the most unsexy, uncool. This was 67. So this was like sort of kind of peak psychedelic period. Uh, and so this idea of a square rectangular box guitar was not meeting my criteria for what I would envision. <laughs> so during the Christmas holiday, I, I, I said, well, I, I can take these materials and maybe I can make something uh, different out of them. Um, I, in eighth grade, I was, uh, I was uh, educated in the, in the public school system, when when there was shop, wood shop, metal shop, auto shop, and things like that. And so in eighth grade, uh, boys took wood shop and or metal shop, and girls took home economics. Uh, and uh, so it turns out that in eighth grade, I, had, I took both wood and metal shop, and I found out that I loved working with my hands. Uh, I loved taking raw material and imagining what you could do with it and turning it into something useful. So in 11th grade, when I was uh, faced with this box, this rectangular box guitar, I said I, I had enough sort of manual skills and a sense that it would be fun potentially to make something out of this. That I said, okay, well, I'm going to turn this into something that would be of interest to me. And uh, I guess so. I actually brought a photo. It's the first time I've ever <laughs> shown this photo. Um, uh, is so I so I. I built this. Ooh. I built this instrument in in my garage in eleventh in eleventh grade over the Christmas holiday. Um, I knew nothing about guitar building. Um, uh, I did. I read somewhere in the library that you could bend wood by by boiling it. So I I boiled wood and then I wrapped it and then I I was this was this was the plywood and I basically found a coffee can and with lots of rubber bands and ropes I just sort of tied the boiled wood around that and left it stay for a while. I had no clamps, so I clamped the top and the back onto the, uh, to the sides by just piling bricks and rocks and things like that. Um, and it worked. Um, and so I was so thrilled with the result, and I was also, I took it to school like early in the, you know, in the winter's term, and it got a lot of attention. Uh, it was, and so in a so when I was approaching the 12th grade, 
I, I was, of course, in a battle with my father about, you know, I was taking all these advanced placement courses, and I was, I said, you know, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to take it. I dropped out of advanced placement math, and took woodshop uh, in the 12th grade, and and I went to the woodshop teacher. I said, look, I want to build instruments. He said, I don't know anything about that, but if you want to do stuff in here, go ahead. And so that's when I built this instrument uh, in 12th grade, and 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 then. Uh, and, the, and, and that started the dialogue with the idea of you, you have an idea for a sound or for something you want, and then you start to and then you and then you find out what you can, get as much information as you can, and then you start to experiment. And inevitably, the materials take you in a different direction. They don't do what you what you want, but they might suggest new things. And so, for instance, like this instrument didn't actually play what I wanted to play, which was like 12-string guitar, like Roger McGuinn and the Birds. Mm -hmm. uh, I had to discover what music it could do well. And so that, so there was a, so it started this process of, of working with, having an idea, working in the materials, create something, and then discovering what the materials actually were capable of, or what my interaction with the materials were actually capable of. And that turned into a musical result. And that process, uh, through the 1970s, was largely inspired by, uh, world music traditions and a composer named Harry Parch, uh, who was a very uh, iconoclastic American artist who built his own, whole own, own orchestra and wrote these extraordinary uh, musical and theatrical compositions for his orchestra of instruments. And he had to train the musicians to perform in them because they didn't have the same tuning systems and things like that that are all the conventional things. So I moved away from electronics and started to build, from acoustic instruments in the, in the late 70s and early 80s and started doing stuff with building electronic instruments. And, and I built, I started working with live tape looping. Uh, and so some of the compositions that, anybody knows my composition, early compositions, a lot of them were, were actually live tape looped compositions. Then I also started to collaborate with theater people. I'm gonna get to something here. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm making a, you know, several decades a little bit short. Um, but I, I, I started to work with in theater and collaborations using these electronic instruments, and I discovered that there was something about the scale that was very important to creating theatrical impact. And so that, you know, opera is big, right? Mm -hmm. It happens on a big stage. It's called grand for a reason. Mm -hmm. Grand opera is because the sets are big, the voices are big, the orchestra, the sound is big. And so I started to think about, well, what would be the relationship of scale when it comes to musical instruments? You know, we mo no normally, when we build a musical instrument, when we think of musical instruments, we think that the musician holds the instrument. And that's true for most of our instruments. Obviously, the piano is different. Uh, percussion is a little is different as well. But we think of a flute, a guitar, a violin. Uh, most world music instruments, the performer holds the instrument. So what if we reverse that paradigm? What if we started to work with the scale of things where the instrument holds the musician? What would, what would happen if you did that? And that question, what would happen if, was really the governing principle of, of my work since like the late 1990s when I moved away from electronics and moved back into building acoustic instruments but informed by this sense of scale and, a, and a, some sort of sense of theatrical impact of the phys physical visual element that, of what the instrument is and also um, the physical interaction of the performers with the instruments because when you make something big you require a much different, so when you see a violinist perform, most of what's making the music is very small motor movement. Uh, obviously, great performers externalize that. And, and they make big gestures and they, maybe they swing their hair, like rock guitarists do, but violinists do that too if they have long hair. And, and, that's, and that's really important part of the theater of performance. So when you build big instruments, that sort of compels that large motor movement to go along with what is usually small motor movement as well. So, uh, one of the... Uh, First, first inventions that I did, um, I had to restart my machine, so I lost a couple of my things. Thank you. So this is a good example. Mm -hmm. So this is a, this was one of the first inventions that came out of that thinking about scale. So it actually started with going to a concert where there was a metronome used uh, as part of the as part of the performance. So does everybody know what a well, first yeah. metronomes used to be? physical objects with a pendulum that moved back and forth, where you adjusted a weight that determined what the period of oscillation was. 
of the pendulum. Nowadays, of course, we all have electronic metronomes if you're a musician, and these, and these sort of pyramidal sort of shaped objects uh, are unknown to people who are under probably about 30 years old. Uh, but I was at a concert in 1995, and there was a pendulum being used, and I was considering this, this theatrical work. I said, well, what would happen if we turned a, pen, a metronome upside down and made it really big? What would be its musical um, potential? What kinds of things could come from it? And I, of course, I knew that pendulums were interesting physical phenomena, that, that they have a period that whether they're moving like this, this far, or moving like this, while their velocity is different, their period is the same. Obviously, there are effects of friction, air, and the friction in the metric, in the, but in a perfect system, their period is identical. So you have, a, that, that alone is a very interesting musical phenomenon, that you have a period that's constant, but that a velocity or a pace of inter, uh, and distance covered that is, that is constantly varying depending on what the swing of the pendulum is. So I started to, I, I, I called up one of my longtime friends uh, named Daniel Schmidt, a longtime collaborator from the 70s when we built American Gaumons together. I said, Daniel, would you collaborate with me? And I've always been a collaborator, making theater, making dance. That's even making any kind of music is collaboration. But so calling up some, a friend to build together and to brainstorm instrument ideas was a very natural part of this an extension of how I normally work with, with other artists. And so we pondered this problem of how to create a pendulum, a large pendulum structure. And it went through many, iter many iterations. And it took, it took about a year and a half to actually create a rigid enough structure that could be used as a theatrical touring instrument, which is what this is a, an a piece called Soundstage, uh, where five performers, and every object, every part of this is as its structure and its uh, all of it is sounding and can be struck or, bow or plucked or bowed. There are, on one side of the pendulum, we're looking at the side which has giant harp strings. So there's, mm -hmm. there's strings that are along the side that are plucked by a mechanism uh, on, the, on the pendulum as it swings back and forth. Mm -hmm. On the other side, there are percussion instruments that another pen an identical pendulum arm uh, swing. it's about, uh, swings and, and strikes percussion instruments. It's about 17 feet tall, it's about 14 feet at the base. And the structure, it's about, you can't see it in this, from this perspective, but it's about five feet deep. Uh, and the structural elements are these sort of um, built-in uh, I-beam uh, tongue drum, or frame drums. So there's actually, you can, people are drumming on the surfaces of it while the pendulum is playing. Another feature of my work is that there's, a, there's often a self-playing element where you put energy into a system, uh, usually through physical motive force of some kind, and that that energy is dissipated in part through sound. So in the case of this, you push the pendulum arm, and it will go for, it could go, depending on how many objects you have in its path, um, it could go for, for a minute and a half to like three or four minutes as it comes to rest, constantly varying its, its, core, its track, so the number of events that are being, interact, being triggered in the course of the path of the movement of the pendulum. That instrument, uh, that experience, led to creating uh, music theater work um, based entirely on invented musical instruments. And I'm going to jump forward in time to, um, to, to, to play a clip from, how much time do I have, by the way? Six minutes, OK. And I have to, OK, well, this is, uh, this is, this is a, I'm going to play a little clip from a musical, music theater piece called Schick Machine, which, uh, which uses a single wonderful performer named Stephen Schick, who basically came to me and said, could you build me a theatrical work of which there's no traditional instruments, and everything is some kind of invented sounding object. So I'm going to play an excerpt where we, where we, we play, he goes through a few instruments. In the course of this, you'll also hear uh, him play something, and then it plays back. And he's live looping. We're, we're live looping what sounds on one of the instruments. I'll annotate it as, we, as it goes. Mm -hmm. Thank <laughs> you. It's a matter of the correct speed. The correct calibration of the various densities of resonant metals and wood. The correct tensioning in the wires. Then nature takes over. Natural forces. Gravitation. 
atmospheric pressure, air. It's so simple. So it's hard to see, but there's a spinning wheel here, and that's bowing the strings. When he presses the strings to the wheel, it creates a mechanical bow. that he's live looping. Because the instruments are big and robust, and they're not real, you know, they're not like you wouldn't want to have a five year old kid pounding on a violin, but they're really okay to, 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 to lay into. So I would stand, I would, I'd dream all those post performance things where the audience was absolutely crazy. And they just love, whether it's adults or kids, they love to get their hands on these things and try to experiment for themselves to see well, how did these sounds, how were these sounds made, made what, uh, you know, what, what is it physically made of? And so, I, after doing that for several years, I said, you know, what if we just forget about the performance and we make this an actually uh, sort of a hands-on installation? And so, we started doing that about two and a half years ago. And now, it's, it's, so it's, it's a whole collection of about 15 instruments, including some of the instruments from Soundstage, from Sound Maze, and some new ones that Daniel and I have created. And we now have an exhibition that tours a lot 
that goes to both museums and performing arts centers, and it's called uh, the Sound Maze. And mm -hmm. uh, that's, uh, and I'll just show a few quick snapshots of that. Um, so this is this is this is the Sound Maze as it's installed mm -hmm. in uh, in a in a huge space in Nashville. With some really nice theatrical lighting. Mm. That's the pipe organ. Uh, this is a giant, essentially a, a music box that plays the pipe organ. Mm -hmm. uh, that's programmable with by moving magnets. Uh, you can you can change the uh, the tune at the loop place. That's the peacock again. Um, that's that's the, that's the evolution of the instrument that that Stephen Schick was playing. Uh, in that first piece called, it's called, the, I call it the hurdy-gurdy. It's based on a medieval folk instrument, the hurdy-gurdy. And I was interested, like I said, in, in the idea of mechanically bowing strings. So I loved that instrument so much that it was very crude. The one you saw in the theater piece was made, it was basically our prototype, where we just sort of experimented with all kinds of things. There's all sorts of vestigial experiments that are on the instrument that we no longer do anything with. So we said, let's make a nicer instrument. And so that's this one, uh, which I use now as a concert instrument. For in, in doing concerts with, with like pieces with invented musical instruments. Um, let's see, let's see. This is this is something. This is a very simple uh, instrument that mostly Daniel designed. This is called the frame drums. Uh, they're they're basically they, they, they're just plywood and they just sound amazing. And uh, uh, if you put if you have give them the kids, they they, they batter them hard. <laughs> and the plywood uh, dies pretty soon. Um, this is a this one. This one, you, it's almost hard to explain. It really, basically, you have to. It's you spin this wheel, and there ball, and there are balls inside, mm -hmm. and so they're not. Some of these are not really musical instruments. They're really sound sculptures. They're really they're, they they do one. A real musical instrument does can can be used for many different kinds of music and many different forms of expression by in the hands of many different artists. These things are usually they do one really interesting one or two very interesting things, and that's it. You couldn't, I couldn't write a symphony with this as the solo instrument. Uh, <laughs> but on the, with the Hurdy Grande, that, that is possible. So I think I'm probably out of time. So uh, ap uh, I don't have any contact information. But you can find me, dressurensemble.org on the internet. Um, and there's lots of things under my name, or Dresher Ensemble on YouTube, if you want to see more things of theatrical productions and things like that. On oh, SoundCloud. <laughs>